Monster Hunter Wilds is going to be the most interactive and linked together environment that we've ever seen in a Monster Hunter game. And I truly think it's a representation of what Capcom has wanted to do with Monster Hunter all along. Let's get right into it. everyone my name is buck we're gonna dive into some of the crazy things we've learned about the environment and just how intricate it is from the tgs showcase i'm not necessarily diving into every detail about what we saw at tgs just some information that we learned that leads us to a deeper understanding of how intricate this world actually is Uth Duna. something i find quite interesting and when Uth Duna body slams into the water creates a tidal wave now this tidal wave seems like it doesn't necessarily do damage to you, but it's going to slow you down. There's a number of different monsters that have different situational attacks that will utilize the environment. Uth Duna automatically does this body slam attack. And if Uth Duna is conveniently enough in the water, the tidal wave happens. This is where I think the separation comes from other monsters that have attacks that utilize the environment compared to Uth Duna, because Uth Duna is just doing Uth Duna things with the body slam attack. And yet we get the tidal wave whenever she's in the water. It seems like a new mechanic that is implemented in Monster Hunter Wilds that we have not seen before and it really excites me because what other monsters could have interesting attacks that when they do their normal attacks the environment then reacts to them and is also part of the attack and affects us in some way. Another aspect of environmental utilization comes with Lala Barina which means the she dancer in Spanish. And this doesn't have to do with Lala Barina attacks, but simply the fact that Lala Barina creates red web due to the red water that is actually all around within the Scarlet Forest. There's a couple different ideas on why this water is red. I was researching it a bit and I discovered something kind of interesting, which talks a bit about something called a red tide, a natural phenomenon that occurs when microscopic algae grow in excessive concentrations. But an interesting fact about a red tide is it can also cause a central nervous system paralysis in fish. So, Lala Barina does have paralysis as its status effect with its little blooms that float down and also your weapons do have paralysis attached to them. Got me thinking, what if the Scarlet Forest isn't necessarily a bunch of rivers and ponds and whatnot, but is actually inlets from an ocean and you have a tide that comes in and this microscopic algae that can really mess things up and also can help Lala Barina be more of an effective monster as far as destroying us and carting us. Now that we've talked about two separate large monsters, I would like to discuss Turf Wars. Turf Wars are definitely back. They look awesome as always and I'm pretty excited about them. Something interesting we found out from the TGS demo is that Turf Wars are going on all the time in the world, whether we're there to see it or not. This also brings in a whole nother aspect of how crazy this world really is, how intricate it is, how much it's just living and breathing and actually functioning without the hunter needing to be there to visually see it or interact with it. I think that within the magic magical and unreal world of Monster Hunter. They're really trying to create the foundation of this world within reality. And so it feels recognizable and it feels like we can understand it and how it works. Yet the things that are actually living in it can be more magical and crazy, just like the world of Monster Hunter that we all love so much. And so that really excites me. Another thing that can happen in the world, whether we are there to see it or not, is that small monsters, when they die, whether they're killed by a large monster, Monster or a bunch of other small monsters took it out. Those carcasses, after they have fully decomposed, do leave bone piles and not just any old bone pile to look at, but ones that we can interact and gather from. This is quite crazy to me. And I think it's another really beautiful example of how this world is truly just existing. We are able to interact with it in a way deeper level than we ever could before. We also have a wide variety of traps that we can utilize within this world. Some of the traps are gonna do more damage and this seems to be something that we can visually see. Like, look, there's giant rocks on the ceiling. When we drop those down, they're gonna do a lot of damage. 
others might not do as much, but there is a variation in that. And some way that we can interact with this is also with our new luring pods. We can hit a monster with a luring pod and basically gain enmity, kind of like we did with Behemoth in Monster Hunter World. We still have that same red line and we can lure that monster to wherever we want for traps, whatever we would like to, or just bring it to a better place to fight it. So this is really exciting as well. An insight that we gain from TGS as well is that these little fishy boy monsters can actually smell blood in the water. So if we start fighting a monster that is probably within some sort of circumference, they're going to swim over there and start attacking that monster as well. They're basically piranhas, giant piranhas. On top of that, it seems that there's some thorns on the side of walls that if a monster walks by them will actually cause it to bleed and the same effect will happen. These little fishy guys are going to go after it once they smell the blood in the water. We also have a little bit of a preview on some of the endemic life and how it interacts with even plant life. We have the Venus flytrap that after this little bird lands on it, snaps it up and eats it. If things like this are going on within the world, even not just between small monsters and endemic life and large monsters, but the plant life as well. I mean, we have the thorns that create the blood. We have these Venus flytraps eating small endemic life. There's got to be so much depth to it. If this is just what we saw from the TGS demo, it's not like we can see everything. We get to see little bits and pieces. There must be so many different examples of things that can actually create more and more of a deeper, more intertwined feeling within this very large and vibrant environment. We even have all of our large monsters interacting with the environment and their strengths and weaknesses and attacks changing based off of the weather that the current locale is in. So that's really cool and I bet you that's going to carry over to the small monsters. I mean we already see with just the different vibrancies, the different plant life, the different things that we see depending on the weather in that area. And that's kind of nuts because not only have they created a world that is very intertwined and just webs together in such a deep, intricate way, this environment changes. And so it's almost like they're doing a lot of these things twice. They're intertwining them twice on different levels. This just seems really bonkers to me. And it makes me really excited because I think they're really delivering on what they've always wanted to do with Monster Hunter. Even something like the save slot menu, we actually have our hunter within the world already. And it's so beautiful. It already kind of gives off that adventurous vibe of like, like, look, we're in the world. We're ready to go. We're going to go out. We're going to kill 69 monsters and we're going to go back to our camp and then we're going to do some random stuff and go back out and kill 69 more monsters. You know the drill. Like this is going to be fantastic. One other thought I would like to bring up is we definitely saw, of course, our wonderful monkey boy Kongalala coming back. And it got me thinking with the way that the environment and the monsters are so intertwined, I wonder if we can venture to say that some monsters might have a higher chance of returning in Monster Hunter Wilds than others, depending on the way that they interact with their environment based on previous titles. Maybe the Monster Hunter Wilds team is looking for opportunities to really let that shine. We have Kongalala's ability to eat mushrooms and create different attacks. That's an interaction with its environment. And maybe other monsters from previous titles will have a higher chance of returning if they have more of an interaction with their surrounding environment. I don't know, who knows? But this is just an interesting idea, something I got thinking about, and maybe you can think about it too. Who fully knows what we can expect, but I do expect it to be way more in-depth and way more intertwined than we realize. I know this is just a couple examples of how the environment actually works, and I know there's a ton more to go over from what we saw and learned in TGS, but for now, I just wanted to dish a few things out to help us to really start thinking about and understanding how crazy this world is gonna be, how exciting it is gonna be to explore it, to adventure in it, to go on tons of monster hunts, and to just spend time wandering around enjoying the beauty of the whole entire world and all the locales, different weather states, all of it, it's gonna be really really fun if you enjoyed this video and you look forward to maybe catching some more insights on monster hunter wilds you can consider subscribing i'm just starting my youtube journey and i would love to have you along but i hope that you gained a little bit of insight from this and i'll be diving into other topics and other aspects of monster hunter wilds that we can get excited about in the future videos along with monster hunter in general so i hope to see you in the next video and i will catch you later